really want to introduce Andy, who's our special guest from the product team here today. Um, Andy, thank you so much for being here. Do you want to just say a, a few quick words and introduction? Yeah, it's great to, to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Andy, I'm senior product manager at Cockroach Labs. I focus in our SQL part of our product area, and um, I'm quite excited to, to share with you all everything from 20.2 and, and to do a spatial demo with you. So I uh, look forward to it. Cool, thanks. And um, I know Andy's, Andy's been having a few Wi-Fi problems today, so hopefully, it, you, hopefully you don't cut up at any point, but um, we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. All right, so let's dive in. I actually wanted to do a quick overview of CockroachDB before we go into the updates and what's new. So for those of you on the, the call who are not familiar with Cockroach, this will be a good introduction. For those of you who are familiar, just hang in there since this will just be like a, a pretty high level five minute overview. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so CockroachDB is a database that lets you build data intensive applications in the cloud um, much easier and with less hassle than you might imagine from a traditional relational database. And it has a lot of key characteristics that help you meet kind of the modern customer's demands for an application. Um, so I'll just go through each of these points just pretty briefly. So CockroachDB, um, it was really, we really built it from the ground up for the cloud. So it is a relational database, but um, it's architected to be a really good fit for the cloud. Um, it has a distributed architecture. And this means that it's also a great fit for microservices. So a lot of our customers um, do have microservices and they really appreciate how CockroachDB is cloud native and works very well with um, platforms like Kubernetes as well. And um, when it comes to easing development, so CockroachDB, we really developed it to be um, developer first and just make working with data a lot easier. So we kind of think about the best database is the one that developers don't have to think about, which is kind of a thankless job if you're a database developer and you just want a product that no one really thinks about. Um, but we do, we do hear a lot from our customers that the best, one of the best things about CockroachDB is that it just works. Um, and the characteristics that really go into this are easy scale that automatically distributes um, data horizontally ac across the cluster, standard SQL. So this is just developer-friendly SQL, what you might expect from Postgres, and support for transactions. Um, and we also do have a managed service available. So this is Cockroach Cloud. And um, we do a lot of customers find that this is, this is super, super helpful and saves them a lot of time. And then finally, CockroachDB meets the needs of what a modern customer might demand. So it's extremely resilient. It can survive node availability zone failures, even region failures. Um, and also if you are running it in a multi-region environment, we, do, we are able to provide low latency reads and writes, um, even in global settings across um, different countries and even continents. So that's a, that's a pretty quick overview. I think just another way to look about it, if you look at it, um, if you're not familiar with it, is that CockroachDB is actually falls into the category of a distributed SQL database, which combines the best of relational and NoSQL. So combines the transactions of a relational database um, like Oracle or Postgres with the, the extreme resilience of a NoSQL database. So I definitely recommend looking into um, <clears throat> the, the distributed SQL category more if you're not familiar with it. And we often get a lot of questions like, what, what do customers use CockroachDB for? So we see two main use cases. The first is just for a general purpose relational database. Um, and then also for more system of record type workloads. So workloads that need these you know, very consistent transactions. Think like a financial, financial ledger or like a shopping cart on an e-commerce site, um, or even like tracking inventory in a retail setting. And finally, just to wrap up this introduction, if you're not familiar, we, we do offer three different versions of Cockroach. Um, so CockroachDB Core, which is our open source version, free, you can just download the binary from our doc site or um, from a few other places, and Enterprise, which is, you know, you have to pay for an enterprise license and it comes with some more features that are more um, suitable for enterprise grade applications, as well as paid support. And, and then we do, as I was mentioning earlier, we do have Cockroach Cloud, which is our managed service. 
Um, and I have a purple box around that because this is, this is our product that's been really growing the fastest and it's super easy to get started. So um, we've been seeing a lot of adoption of that recently. And then just quickly, I'm gonna mention that all the features we're gonna be covering today, all the new stuff in 20.2 is, um, is available for free in the open source core version. Um, so it will be super easy to, um, to try them out. And I did see a question come through about, is Cockroach Cloud available on Azure? It is not currently available on Azure, but this is a, a very large customer request that we see a lot. So we are actively working on that. Cool. Um, so now I'm gonna dive into what's new in our, our latest release, 20.2. So the theme of 20.2 was build more, deploy easier, innovate faster. And what that means is we focused on these kind of like these two main areas for our different users. So the build more side of things is we are focusing on updates to make developers more productive and kind of give them more tools to work with. Um, so this includes spatial data, as Andy mentioned briefly earlier, and that's going to be what our demo is about later. And then the deploy easier side of things was for really for like the operators, the DBAs, the SREs, um, a lot of operational and security improvements um, related to Kubernetes and um, security. Um, and then the final, the last final area was performance, which I think we're also pretty excited to dive into since we saw some significant improvements in performance in 20.2. Cool, so I'm gonna dive into the, uh, the first side of build more empowering developers. Um, and but before I actually go into some of the updates, I wanted to to give a quick update on, or sorry, a quick um, overview on what like what SQL support we currently have in CockroachDB for people who aren't as familiar. And I think this is a good time to pass it off to Andy and let him give you kind of an overview of SQL in CockroachDB. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Megan. So uh, CockroachDB is a is a SQL database. Um, we we subscribe to the SQL standard. We we actually follow the Postgres. Um, a wire protocol and, and actually have Postgres compatibility in terms of how we've implemented SQL. Um, and we did this because we, we knew it was uh, trusted and, and well-respected and, and you know expressive. And, and it was a meaningful thing for, for people to have. And so by, by making this decision, um, it, it means that you can use the drivers and RMs from the rich Postgres ecosystem that you might already be familiar with, with CockroachDB. Now we, we have a few features that are enhanced, a few things that are different uh, in Cockroach versus Postgres. So um, many drivers and RMs actually now have their own dive for Cockroach and we have enhanced capabilities here, but um, really one of the real benefits of, of Cockroach is that you can tap into that ecosystem and, and use it um, while you're going about accomplishing these various other activities. Uh, we also offer a native JSON support. And so, you know, what this means is that um, we are a relational database and you can have all of the, the schemas and the indexes and secondary indexes and all of those kinds of things that you would expect from a SQL database. But we provide some flexibility too um, if you can't normalize your, your schema entirely, if you do want to have a, a column with JSON data in it and, and keep more information. And so we, we kind of provide you that flexibility. We can still have the relational guarantees that you want, um, but, but you have some flexibility as, as how you're approaching your results. Um, that's really that's what SQL is for us is it's permissive, it's expressive, and it, it gives you the opportunity to, to build the application the way you want to build it. Thanks, Andy. And yeah, I, I included a screenshot of our one of the SQL pages on our docs site. So just a quick shout out to our education team. They're amazing. Our docs are, are awesome. So we we'll definitely recommend checking out some of our SQL docs if you're, if you're interested to learn a little bit more. Um, all right. So Andy, are you there? Oh, his Wi-Fi has been acting up so much today. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll let Andy go into a little more detail when he's able to join again, but I just wanted to, to start out talking about one of the most exciting features that we've introduced. Andy, you there, Andy? Okay. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were saying that your Wi-Fi has been fine for the past six months and then today it's just decided to act up, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I tried restarting my hardware a couple of times. So uh, hopefully I'll, I'll cross my fingers and hope it gets better. But uh, okay. yeah, so sorry if this is disruptive. Uh, yeah, even the best laid plans can be interrupted, right? By uh, yeah. poor work from home Wi-Fi. Yeah, uh, so I was just introducing Spatial and saying this is one of the most exciting updates that we've added for 20.2. Um, and do you want to give a quick overview of, of what we added in, in Spatial and why yeah, it's yeah. special? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, spatial, in the way, the best way to think about this is an ex extra set of use cases you cannot use in CrackCoachDB. So um, we provide you the same bulletproof resilience and, and scale that you get with, with CrackCoachDB. It's just we've now extended our functionality to operate in the spatial section. And so um, as we were thinking about doing this, we, we actually modeled this off, uh, off of PostGIS, which is the um, extension on Postgres that is uh, offers spatial capabilities. It's one of the most popular extensions. It's been around for a long time. It's well trusted. Um, you know, and we wanted to, to give people that same guarantees and same expectations there. So um, we do have post gist compatible syntax um, in our implementation, and um, it lets you kind of use the same IP API, same you know experiences you've already had already. Um, we do a few things that, that are different though. We have a, a different indexing option. So our indexing option is actually a little bit more scalable um, and it, it, it's consistent with how we approach um, generally building a database as well. So you, you get the familiarity of PostGIS, but you get enhanced scaling and, and other capabilities that come with CockroachDB built in. Um, as a part of this, we've, we've provided both of the most common data types, geometry and geography. We have lots of different uh, external formats like GeoJSON and well-known text. We'll show some examples of those later today. Um, all of the kind of common 2D uh, shapes, point, line, polygon, multi-polygon. Um, and then, you know, uh, approximately 230 of the built-ins that um, PostGIS is popular, things like SD contains and, and other things in this process. So we have a, a fairly rich doc uh, ecosystem here of, of docs that explain these kinds of things. Um, but you should be able to, to really take advantage of this right away from our our release at 20.2. Finally, the last thing I'll say here is that um, we had a huge impact from the open source community in building uh, this functionality. Um, one, I think because a lot of people were really excited for Cockroach to add it, so they were keen to participate. Um, and it was a really great place for people who wanted to learn about Go or learn about databases or already cared about Spatial but wanted to enhance the functionality to uh, be involved with an open source project like CockroachDB. So um, it was it was great that we were able to do this. And you know, part of our decision to put all of the spatial capabilities into the uh, into the core product, the open source product, was that um, we wanted to reflect that understanding and, and give back to the community and make sure that everybody could could take advantage of this functionality. So um, we're we're quite excited about this. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our Slack uh, public Slack that has a spatial channel, a contributors channel, and a, a great opportunity for everyone to engage on these kinds of topics. Yeah, absolutely. And just moving on to the next part of SQL, um, we, we did add a lot more SQL functionality this time around. And I've actually, I've been at Cockroach for about a year and a half now. And I know with every, with every major release, we are always adding additional SQL functionality. So mm -hmm. could you, Andy, could you just give an overview of, you know, like what we added this time around, kind of what our goal is eventually with, with this SQL stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we've really focused on in the last, uh, you know, last release is um, extending the, the flexibility of developers and their schema design and in using CockroachDB. So um, we've added support for enums, enumerated types. Um, these are kind of like drop downs on a website. Um, they're quite useful for, for building different capabilities. Um, partial indexes are something we're, we're excited about. So this lets you be more expressive in deciding how much you want to index from your, your table. Um, we see these to be really popular where, where you need good read performance, but you don't want to impact all the values in, in a column. So you want to, you want to you know, express a, a partial index for, for these kinds of things. And so um, this is a way to um, get the same read performance on the things that matter without impacting write performance in, in other places. Um, similarly, user-defined schemas in, in um, Cockroach before this, we had this concept of um, a database and then a database has tables. In Postgres, they have the uh, sort of concept of a node a node has schemas, schemas have tables. And so um, we've actually introduced in Cockroach now the same three layer concept. So you have databases, the database has schemas, and schemas have tables. And um, what this allows you to do is to separate out um, permissions and, and, and logic and acceptance on, on different schemas. And it also makes it a little bit better for our third party tool and story because um, it's a very popular pattern for a third party tool to keep the metadata and other information about the tool itself in a separate schema. And so having these things sort of makes these tools work more, more natively right off the bat. Um, and finally, the last feature that we are uh, highlighting here is materialized views. This is a, another way for you to um, express information that matters on your data to get updates on it, to refresh that information. Um, it's, it's really just, again, all about providing you the flexibility to use the tool that is most meaningful for your workload and, and your development environment. 
Um, and, and, you know, similarly, that's translated into a, a, a large increase in the compatibility story in terms of our third party ecosystem. So um, in previous releases, we focused on expanding out Go, expanding out support for Python. So, you know, we have all the most popular drivers and ORMs um, available there. And then, you know, this release, we extended that to, to Java and Ruby and, you know, rounded out Go and another capability. So um, really, we, we expect that everyone should be able to have great experience, you know, no matter what language they want to use. We, we believe in sort of polyglot architecture and, and the ability to, for the developer to, to not only use the language they want to, but to have access to the tools um, that they want to within that language. And so um, we're, we're quite excited about this and increase the functionality for, for our developers. Yeah. And similar to Spatial, we, all, we had a lot of open source contributions around, um, around this compatibility with these tools, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, several are being maintained by uh, external contributors. We've given back to various open source projects as well to um, encourage them to, to use Cockroach. And so, you know, we definitely consider this to be part of our um, being a good member of the community um, efforts. Yeah, and we always want to hear also if there's a particular tool that Cockroach doesn't support, we want to hear that since we want to make sure that, you know, it works with your preferred environment. So let us cool. know. Absolutely. So we, we do have one question related to this. Um, you know, one of our attendees is asking, you know, is the goal always to main parity with Postgres or do you see a point at which things will diverge? Um, we're definitely intending to, to maintain uh, Postgres compatibility. Now, what I will say is, um, you know, there are features that we have built that Postgres does not have, um, you know, things like our partitioning or other capabilities. And um, I expect that will continue to happen is that we'll add functionality that Postgres doesn't have access to. But, um, you know, we, we plan to to stay compatible with Postgres and to, you know, follow and, in, in, uh, you know, along in their footsteps and make sure that all of the general purpose reliability and functionality that you expect is also present in Cockroach. All right. So another area that we, we focused on a lot was improving Cockroach DB's monitoring story. Um, so we know that's obviously a, a very important part of running a database um, for developers and for operators. So we made a bunch of updates to the, um, the DB console, which is <clears throat> um, previously we called it the admin UI. We just changed the name to the DB console. Uh, but uh, Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about, before we dive into the updates, just about what the, what the DB console is, what it helps people with, and just a little more detail. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, observability comes in and monitoring comes in a couple of different flavors and, and views. Um, logs are a place that a lot of people like to start. We have logs that are permissive and, and expressive, and you can, you can look through those. Um, we also have endpoints that we make available for time series information. And so uh, that, that information can be, you know, we're put into a third party and you can kind of see how things look you know, as far as that's concerned for, for various metrics. And then um, the big one that we actually include directly within the product is our DB console. And so this actually comes in every binary of Cockroach. It's built in. And so um, everybody has access to use this functionality. And we encourage everybody to do it because it provides really two great angles of information. One is about the uh, cluster itself. So you can look at the hardware and understand the CPU usage and you know, various other sort of big picture understanding of the cluster and its health associated with that. And then we have a, a sort of developer focused view of um, providing information about statements and how long they take and what's happening and what's most frequent and what do the fingerprints look like and really helping you to start to answer these questions of, you know, do I have any problematic queries? And if so, you know, why are they problematic and how do I address them and, and what do I do with them? And so um, we're quite committed to, to always kind of improving this observability story across all you know, levels here. Um, and, and several of the updates for 20.2 are, are in that thing. Yep, so we added two new pages to the DB console for 20.2, which is the, the sessions page and the transactions page. Um, and I know, could, yeah, if you could just explain a few more details here and um, how they relate to some of the other pages that I think we added another, another similar page last time as well. So just some context there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll start with the sessions page. Um, you know, you could also think about this as related to connections. Um, this is about seeing actually what's actively happening right now. So on the sessions page, you can see the um, active transactions. You can see the active statements that are happening. You can see how long they've taken their duration. Um, it's about sort of providing you a live look at what's actively happening. And so, you know, one potential place of, of things that could be problematic are long running transactions or long running statements. And so you could actually filter and sort by that information. Um, and then on the sessions page, you can actually cancel any problematic statements or problematic sessions. Um, and so this is really powerful because it lets you, you know, do this, you know, find and fix something directly right from the, the DB console itself. 
If we work our way down a layer, um, you go from sessions into individual transactions. Um, this page is a, is a historical view of the transactions that are occurring most frequently. It shows the, the, the grouping of all the statement fingerprints that comprise that transaction. Um, and this lets you see really at that unit, that business unit of what matters. And so we, we see a lot of customers like you know, banks or others have you know, certain core transactions that matter for them and, and being able to see all the statements that comprise those, the retries associated with them, rows affected, latency, these kinds of things are, are really powerful for them in that process. The last page, is, this page isn't new, but the statements page is something we've had for a while, but it, it relates to this process because of course, if the transactions are the grouping of all the statements, then you wanna have a statements page where it has all of the individual statement fingerprints in them. And so um, this information is, has been um, improved to show a few more pieces of information, um, and make it easier for folks to, to filter and sort upon this kind of thing. And, and so they all sort of relate together of telling that, that big picture story here. Yeah, and just wanted to highlight for the sessions page, you can actually cancel the sessions from it. So is this the first time we've added something where you can actually affect the cluster from the UI? Yeah, it's it's the first time you would really take direct action for the cluster uh, from the UI. We, we do have a, um, a uh, bundle option for a slow query where you can capture information about it, a trace and, and other sort of information to read about it and investigate further. But um, this is the first time where you can actually change what's happening in the cluster itself, which is quite exciting. And it looks like we did have a question come in um, the Q&A. Yeah, so um, I think this is back in our, our talking about our Postgres compatibility and Python ORMs. Um, so we, we have support for uh, the two biggest ones, Django and SQL Alchemy. Uh, we also have support for um, Kiwi and Pony ORM, uh, which are two smaller uh, Python ORMs that are, are popular and, and rising in popularity. And of course, all of these use the Psycho PG2 uh, driver. And so all of these things have, have support for Cockroach and, and are built in. And uh, you know, if, if there is another Python ORM that is, is meaningful to you, um, as Megan said, please, please let us know, share it with us in Slack and a GitHub issue or or uh, drop it in the chat here. Um, but we, we always want to hear about the tools that, that matter to our, our developers. Yep. All right, so moving on to performance. So as I mentioned in the opening, we did see significant performance improvements um, this time around for Cockroach DB, but you know, we, we, we take performance pretty seriously here and we, we run benchmarks um, every, every release that we have. And we do have this detailed page on docs. So it goes into performance, um, the TPC benchmark and the sys bench, um, benchmark. Um, so Andy, can you give some background and just kind of like our approach to benchmarking here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we know that performance matters and, and we want to um, always be, you know, communicating the, the current state of the world so that everybody is as well informed and can make good decisions. And so um, we actually run performance tests every single night um, at Cockroach. We run TPCC, we run, um, various other are the tests like this, and we watch for regressions. We look for speed ups. We look for ways to improve these kinds of things moving forward. And then, um, you know, each time you make a major release, we update this performance page so that we can communicate to everybody um, what to expect out there and, and how things are changing. So, in a second, on subsequent sides, we'll show you some some changes that have happened in the course of the 20.2 release. Um, but this page is always the the best place to go if you want to know about general performance questions. Of course, you know. These are for industry standard benchmarks and, and you know, individual workloads always have different characteristics. So um, you know, we're happy to, to answer any questions that people might have about their individual workloads or, or to work through this process, but this will give you a really sort of representative good understanding of the, the general performance profile of Cockroach DB. Yep. Um, and it looks like we had a question actually come in about TPC um, in the, the chat. Um, yeah, so, so the question here is um, people aren't updating uh, TPCC. Is there a more relevant benchmark to pursue? So um, this is kind of interesting. The, I'm, I'm not going to go on a tangent too far on this, but Megan, we'll be back in if you want me to. The, um, the, the, the TPC organization is something that's been around for 30-ish uh, years now. Um, and in part, it's a consortium of um, hardware vendors, software vendors, various other folks. And um, for a long time, it was used to sell uh, pre-cloud days. It was used to really promote individual hardware performance capabilities. Um, and so a lot of the earliest benchmarking and official results that were posted on their website were done from, uh, from wanting to display hardware capabilities. 
now that things have moved into the cloud, we've moved from having the, the biggest, baddest, most expensive machine possible to having lots of commodity machines. And so um, a lot of the cloud providers haven't chosen to engage in this, this capability in the past. And so that's why you see a little bit fewer results here on the, the capabilities, but we still think it's a really well-designed benchmark and something that we, we want to continue to work through. There are a couple of other benchmarks that we're interested in. And so um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of teaser in that um, you can expect to see more benchmarks from Kako GB in the coming months. Um, but there, the, this is a really uh, well-represented and reasoned benchmark that um, definitely stands the test of time. Um, let's see. So there's a couple other questions here related to performance. Um, I'm going to, uh, I guess I'll briefly answer a few of them, which is that um, there's a question about connection pooling. Um, connection pooling is a, is a fascinating and interesting topic. Um, we we uh, are actually in the process of updating our documentation around connection pooling. So um, the short answer is stay tuned and we'll provide more information there. The, the slightly longer answer is that um, you know, we, we are well designed to take advantage of many connections and to you know, handle these processes and handle them well. Obviously too many connections can be, um, can be problematic. And so there's, there's some element of personal tuning that's needed for that. Um, but we, we, definitely, um, we, we definitely don't think that, that um, there's any problem with Cockroach handling lots of connections in the process. Um, so when we have more documentation, we'll, we'll definitely let you know, but that is something that we're actually actively working on at the moment. Um, there's another question about uh, how does uh, Cockroach GB handle join performance? Uh, and so we, we actually work well with joins. Um, we had a blog post very early on in our days about joins not being very performant with Cockroach GB. And I think, um, you know, that has since really evolved and changed quite dramatically. We've um, improved and actually built our own cost-based optimizer from scratch that is really sort of the brains of the database. It's, it, it evaluates queries, evaluates joins, figures out the most efficient way to plan. Um, we actually, with the 20.2 release, have improved um, and, and expanded upon our vectorized execution engine, which is a, a calmer way of executing uh, data that's really useful in these sort of large aggregations, large joins, these kinds of things. And so um, you'll see in a second when we talk about TPCH performance, um, some of the improvements that have come from that. But um, in the purpose of a general OLTP, we actually believe that um, there, there should be no problem using you know, aggregations and joins. Of course, we're, we're not an OLAP database, and there are lots of other great OLAP databases that are out there. But um, we do believe that you should, you should be able to get the join performance you need out of a, a OLTP database. Um, so we'll move on to the next, um, whoops, I clicked ahead too much. Hold on. Here we go. So we'll move on to just the, the updates for 20.2. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we saw improvements on the TPCC and the TPCH benchmark. So I'll just, I'll just pass it off to you again, Andy, so you can yeah. talk about both of them, both the improvements. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, TPCC, we talked about a little bit already. It's a really great benchmark for OLTP workloads. Um, we always look at TPCC both on smaller clusters and on larger clusters because we want to make sure that there's no performance degradation as, as that changes. Um, and so what we've seen and when we compare 20.2 to 19.2 uh, or last year's release about this time is that we actually seen a 40% improvement um, with the same resources. And so um, this is meaningful because this means that, that um, without you doing anything, just upgrading to 20.2 versus older releases, you're gonna see a much more efficient database and be able to take advantage of the resources you have now. And so um, we're, we're quite excited about this. Um, this is translated into us testing at 81 nodes or, or a fairly large cluster size for, for folks. Um, and we see here that we've gone from 100,000 warehouses, which is one of the main units of measurement in TPCC uh, to 140,000. And so it was important for us to demonstrate this efficiency because we, we always wanna be following that linear curve of you, know, you have a certain performance at a certain number of nodes. If you increase those nodes, you wanna have a, a correspondingly linear increase in performance. Um, of course, we could push this number much higher um, in terms of total performance, um, but we want to see, we want to be able to hold things constant so you can see how things are evolving without uh, changing too many factors here in the process. And so um, this is this is really um, something that I'm, I'm really proud about for the team uh, is that we've gotten so much better in terms of our efficiency here um, over the last year. Yeah, definitely. And then we also focused on the TPCH benchmark actually for one of the first times. So can you give some background on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, TPCH is the, it's from the same TPC organization. It's the corresponding benchmark 
to TPCC, but more focused on analytic queries or more focused for OLAP databases. And so um, we're definitely not going to replace the importance of TPCC with TPCH. But what TPCH is really good for is um, making sure that we're evaluating the performance of those complex joins and aggregations that were asked about earlier. Um, and so it's a benchmark that we, we use to measure ourselves because we, we want to be increasing our performance and, and showing how things work here um, over time. But um, again, we're not uh, aiming to be an OLAP database. And so you, you shouldn't take this benchmark as, as an assumption that we're heading that direction. Um, TPCH is really all about latency and about reducing latency over time. And so you could see that um, there, there's 22 queries in TPCH and for um, the vast majority of the queries, we've actually dramatically reduced the latency of those queries. Um, there's a, a, a part of the explanation for this is improvements in our cost-based optimizer. We've actually improved our join reordering algorithm. So um, in SQL, it's declarative. You, you um, write a SQL uh, uh, statement that tells us what information you want back from the database. And then we actually take that statement and evaluate it and try a bunch of different ways of um, providing back that information to you. And then we pick the sort of most um, performant way of returning that information. And so um, having a joint reordering algorithm that's improved means that there's more ways we can consider to write that statement to find the best performance possible. And so we're quite excited with the, with the improvements in the cost-based optimizer. The vectorized execution engine is now on for almost all complex joins and aggregations. Um, this dramatically speeds things up. It actually uses less memory as well. So um, we're, we're quite excited about the improvements here in TPCH. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, I know we have we have a few more slides and then we have the demo. So I, we did have two questions come through. So maybe we can just quickly address those questions and then we can move on and have enough time. Yeah, so um, there was a question about uh, Jepson analysis on newer versions. Um, we actually run Jepson tests as well every night, the way we run performance tests uh, to make sure that we don't have any regressions on that. So we, we don't have any plans to do a Jepson analysis in the, in the short term, um, but we, we definitely stand by our, our initial passage of the the Jepson test and the, the uh, blog from Kyle accordingly. Um, and we definitely continue to run these tests on a nightly basis to make sure there's no regressions there. Mm -hmm. um, there was also a questions about 21.1. Um, I'm not gonna share too much about 21.1 just because uh, you know I'm a product person, I'm supposed to be a little cagey on those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> but I, I can tell you that uh, we are quite excited about our roadmap there. Um, and there should be some, some information here in the, in the coming months to share more about that. But um, we're, we're definitely continuing along in the same path that, that the improvements in this uh, deck uh, for 20.2 describe. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll, be, we'll put updates into the, the community Slack channel. So if you want to get updates, you should just join that. Um, the other thing then, is, oh, sorry, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you can subscribe to our release notes for the alphas for 21.1. And so as functionality makes its way into that, if you want to see what's coming, you can you can definitely peek at those 21.1 uh, alphas. And we love people that try out our, our alphas and give us feedback on, on early versions. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, there was also one, one more question. I think we might not have time to get into this, but there was a question in the chat about how do the, sc the scalability of Cockroach compare to Cassandra? Maybe we can just point them to some resources um, since I'm not sure we can, we have too much time. Yeah, there's actually a webinar directly on this, I believe that is yeah. on our, our website. So um, maybe one of the, the folks listening from Cockroach can put a link in the in the chat there, but if not, you can find it directly on our website about a whole webinar that, I, that does this, this comparison uh, yeah. for you. Good call. All right. So I'm gonna just briefly touch on some of the updates related to deployment um, and then let Andy take over for the spatial demo. Um, all right, so there are two main things that I just wanna talk about. The first is Cockroach Cloud. So when we're talking about easing deployment of a database, we uh, like 100% have to talk about Cockroach Cloud since that's its whole purpose. The whole purpose is to make management and operating the database just incredibly low lift. So you, Again, you just don't have to think about it. So um, Cockroach Cloud is actually, we actually update it on a weekly basis and release on a weekly basis. Um, so it doesn't really follow this twice a year schedule that we do with, with Cockroach DB. But um, just kind of some highlights from the past few months of stuff that we've updated for Cockroach Cloud is we did add VPC peering in both Google Cloud and AWS. So this was a top requested feature from our customers. And I know people are super happy to have it now. So it means that they can connect on a private network from um, to, uh, to the database and just adds a lot more security. And we also did add some more self-service features. So things that you can do within the console, including um, self-service backups and 
you know, other things just to quickly mention, there are other things that are also self-service, like you can add and remove node to scale up and down. Um, you can up, you upgrade to the latest major yourself. So people who are currently running Cockroach Cloud have the option to upgrade to 20.2. And there's a lot of really good functionality in there. So let's see. Um, cool. So moving on just to the the last thing that I just wanted to mention quickly um, is we actually introduced a, a beta a Kubernetes operator this um, a few weeks ago. So I mentioned earlier in the beginning that CockroachDB is a really good fit for Kubernetes. So it actually shares a lot of the same distributed principles. And we, we do have a ton of content on Kubernetes on our website. So definitely check that out if you're curious. But you know, you, you can actually run CockroachDB within Kubernetes pods using stateful sets or some other tools. And um, so we didn't need an operator in the sense of, you know, some more traditional databases, legacy databases that like absolutely need an operator to work with, um, to work with Kubernetes. But we actually did find that, so internally, internally we run Cockroach Cloud on Kubernetes. And we just had a lot of learnings over the past, um, you know, six months to a year of ways that we can make running Cockroach DB on Kubernetes a lot easier. And we kind of packaged up these learnings into this new operator. So it really eases the deployment and management and um, upgrades of the database on Kubernetes. So I think that that's basically the, kind, the, the main overview that I wanted to give here. And again, we have a lot of really good content on the website about Kubernetes. And I think, I think honestly, that's it. It doesn't look like we have any more questions here. So I think Andy, I can actually just pass it over to you to give the spatial demo. Yeah, absolutely. So before I, I share my screen, I just, uh, a couple of things to, to remind everybody here. Um, spatial can be used for lots of different things. Uh, so you can um, use it for um, both geometry and geography types. You can use it for um, figuring out, uh, you know, is my house located in a floodplain? Should I buy this house or not? If you're an insurance company, you can figure out, you know, what should I charge for insurance based on this information? Um, we see it usage in uh, video games. So things like Pokemon Go uh, that were popular a few years ago. Um, really special is used at kind of all kinds of B2B and B2C companies. And there's all kinds of interesting uh, use cases for spatial. Um, today, I'm going to show a demo using actually the um, New York City data um, that is used by the PostGIS demo itself. And, and part of this is just to let everybody know that, you know, everything that you can do with PostGIS, for the most part, you can do with CockroachDB. Um, and we'll kind of go through and, and show how this works. So let me share my screen. All right. Um, so it's not important that you look too closely uh, behind the, the curtain at this Atom uh, field, but um, if you want to, I'll show you what's happening as we go through and, and look at the demo itself. Um, I've done a few things already ahead of time to set up this demo. Um, I've set up a three node cluster on my uh, MacBook. Um, I have connected and started uh, that cluster. And then I actually took the data, as I mentioned here, um, we, we have some scripts set up for um, this geospatial spatial data. Um, and I've imported that data and, and put it into Cockroach just so that everything will be ready for us as we get started here. So um, let's take this and um, we are in the SQL shell now. So the first thing I wanna do is show you a little bit about the um, New York City neighborhoods data that we're gonna be looking at here. Um, so we have this nifty uh, show create table statement that lets you see the, the table as if you wanted to create it yourself and copy it and paste it. Um, and you can see that um, we have uh, a borough name here present. So um, for those of you that have visited New York or are in New York, um, you know, we have uh, five, five boroughs that people uh, typically refer to, you know, the Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, et cetera. Uh, and then there are many names, uh, many neighborhood names that are part of those boroughs. Um, and so we, we've kind of put this information in and then we have, um, we have our, our spatial data here, our, our geometry column that's using a multi-polygon shape uh, to, to represent this information and to, to have coordinates around this information. And so, um, you know, we, as we go through, we'll kind of see what this data looks like and you can kind of see how these things map together. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is show you a little bit about what this data looks like. And, um, you know, if you're like me, you might look at this and say, whoa, what is that? That is 
that is a little hard to read. So um, we've got the Bronx here, this is that borough name. We've got a uh, specific um, neighborhood within the Bronx. Uh, and then we have this uh, spatial data that's this, this well-known binary format that's um, kind of long and, and meant to be processed by computers and not really read by people. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is um, some simple built-ins that transform this kind of information. Uh, so these are these are PostGIS compatible uh, built-ins. Um, you know, the first one here is going to transform this into the SRID 4326. This is the lat long SRID. So to put this in lat long data, that might be a little more uh, easy to see. And then we're also going to convert it to um, to well known text here uh, instead of well known binary in the process. So let's take a look at um, this information. Again, this is still kind of hard to read. Uh, you can start to see that there are multi polygon shapes. You can see lat long uh, information present in here in the data um, you know as we go through the, the process so let's let's start to do something interesting with this data itself rather than just look at it um, and, and sort of how it's at present so um, first i'm going to show you all of the names uh, of the the uh, boroughs as well as the neighborhoods and so you know we see these relationships here present of you know there's a borough of queens it has a neighborhood of ridgewood and continuing along and we're going to pick one out of it um you'll see why here in a minute but we're going to pick the chelsea neighborhood from manhattan um, and we're going to look a little bit more at that so um, just to make this easy for us to see all the information around this um, i'm going to type this query in um, all we're doing here is we're, we're getting that uh, manhattan uh, borough the chelsea name um, and we're going to get the uh, the information here um, for this. Now, one thing that you might notice it's a little different this time is that um, this starts to look like JSON, and that's because I converted it to GeoJSON. Um, the reason I did that is I want to show you a tool here in a bit that uses GeoJSON. But you can just see that as we've gone through this, that, that spatial lends itself to manipulating the data in various ways. We started well-known binary, went to well-known text, we used lat long and SRIDs, and now we're looking at it in terms of GeoJSON around lat longs here in the process. So um, I am going to open up a tool called GeoJSON.io. This is a pretty nifty tool that lets you kind of just introspect and, and see some things about um, spatial data. And I'm going to take these results that we got from uh, this query above. So there's results about Chelsea, um, and I'm going to put them directly into uh, into the map. And so what's cool about this is you put this data in and it automatically resizes. If we zoom out a little bit, you can see that uh, we're in New York, we're in Manhattan here. Um, and then you can start to see and visualize this multi polygon shape. And so when we say multi polygon, we mean that there are multiple polygons present. And so you can see how there's a polygon around each of the piers here. Um, you know that there are, um, you know, multiple shapes that this could be kind of rebroken down into. Um, the reason I picked Chelsea to show you on the map is because um, it's actually where the Cockroach Labs headquarters are. And so uh, we are on 23rd Street here between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue, uh, right about here on the block, I, I believe. Um, and so, you know, a lot of things that people want to do with spatial data is understand the relationships between things. So you might want to ask yourself a question like, is the New York City office in the Chelsea neighborhood, right? Um, and of course, we could visually inspect that and do this, but a lot of things that power these customer facing applications are actually queries that, that go about that. And so let's jump back into the, to the demo itself and, and look at how we might go about doing that. Um, just in the interest of time, I went ahead and got the lat long of the office and have it uh, present here. Um, and so we're going to do a, a simple query to check to see, um, is this point of the Cockroach Labs office in the multi polygon that is Chelsea, uh, the, the neighborhood? Um, and so we're going to use a couple different functions. Um, the first is we're going to use this ST contains function. And so this is a really interesting function because what it does is it says, um, here's one shape. So in this case, Chelsea. And then it takes a second argument, which says, um, here's another shape. And is that second shape within the first shape? So um, that second shape, or in this case, the point is the Cockroach Labs. And we're going to check and see if this point of Cockroach Labs is in the multi polygon shape of uh, of Chelsea. And so let me copy this and head down here. And what you'll see is that this returns a true. So the ST contains returns a true false statement. Um, and really, we just kind of wanted to show how you would build up to doing something where you're investigating what's going on here. Of course, you could do a more sophisticated join against this data and, and go that directly. You don't have to put this information all in directly exactly as it's displayed here. But we wanted to show you the step-by-step -step process of, of how you might go about doing something basic here in the process. 
Um, spatial data lends itself to doing lots of interesting things. You, you can um, you know, check to see uh, the relationship between two shapes. You can um, check to see about other data that's in relation to those shapes. And so um, one of the things that has been um, you know, uh, uh, talked about a lot this year is um, you know, the, the um, diversity and understanding how uh, you know, different populations are, are located in different areas and how people interact. And, um, you know, so we're taking some census information here and we're gonna look at um, for each of the boroughs that I talked about, each of the five boroughs, what is the percentage of people that are not white in those boroughs, right? This, this might be something we're interested in as a researcher, or as a journalist, or we might want to, uh, you know, to, to be very, in various ways, thinking and looking at data as it relates to the concept of spatial data. So um, that's what we're doing here in this query. Um, I'm gonna put it in place here. And um, what we can see here is that, you know, we're taking this borough name and we're doing this, this uh, percentage function to figure out the, the population from our census data. We're ordering it by the, grouping it by the borough name. And we can kind of see in here then that, you know, from, from lowest to highest, the non-white percentage in Staten Island is the lowest, whereas, you know, the Bronx the highest. And um, these are the types of questions you can start to answer and ask with spatial data. And we know that there's lots of people at both B2C and B2B companies that, that are excited to use spatial data. Um, and to, to be able to take advantage of this. And we're, we're quite excited to offer this functionality. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have about 230 built-ins and functions already supported, most popular data types, data formats. Um, but you know, this is our first offering. So we, we want everybody to try it. Let us know what you think. Let us know if we're missing anything. Um, but we're, we're quite excited to, to arm our users with another use case in which they can, um, they can use the uh, resilience and, and scale and reliability of Cockroach DB. Thanks, Andy. That was awesome. What questions, either about spatial or otherwise, do do folks have? Looks like there aren't too many questions, <clears throat> so we can go ahead um, and wrap up. Let me just pull up my slides real quick. All right. Um, so yeah, if, if any more questions come up, just feel free to, to email either of us. I know, Andy, you're always open to getting emails with questions or posts in the Slack channel. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we love feedback. Please, please give it all to us. Yeah. And would recommend looking at the 20.2 docs. So we have a whole docs landing page with all the new features and, and links out to other pages. So if you want to learn more, take a look there. And we do have some good um, blog posts about some of the new features in um, in 20.2 as well. It looks like we might have gotten a few more questions in the Q and A. Do we get any? Yeah. So we we got a couple of questions around performance testing for spatial. Um, okay. Spatial is a little tricky. It doesn't have a corresponding like TPCC or TPCH benchmark that um, we can say, look, we've achieved the performance you might wanna wanna receive here. Um, we have done performance testing on it. Um, we've had several clients try it out yet, and so far we haven't had any performance concerns with our, um, you know, with spatial and using the um, inverted indexes and the indexing strategy that we put in place. Um, but of course, you know, we, we can't guarantee for for all workloads and all times it'll be where we need to be. We we can say that we're committed to making spatial. Uh, work and work well for everyone. And so, um, you know, we'd, we'd welcome any uh, benchmarks, any tests that people are curious for us to try out. Um, and then, of course, if you're, if you, um, you know, want to work on your specific workload and see how it does, we, we'd, of course, love that feedback as well. So, um, you know, we, we don't know of any concern, uh, specific performance concerns at this point, but, um, you know, definitely, definitely be in touch with us and, and let us know if uh, there are things you'd like to see us try and, and test out. Cool. And yeah, so I guess the last thing is just when you exit the um, the webinar, you will see the exit survey and it'll have a few questions on what you thought today and definitely share all the feedback you have. We we want to know everything large or small. Um, and we really take that into consideration for, for next time in the future. And then the second page of the survey will have your information. So you can fill out um, your information to enter the raffle to get one of these amazing um, warm winter hats with the Cockroach DB logo. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andy, so much for, for being here and um, taking your time as well. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for spending an hour with us. We appreciate it. Well, thanks, guys. Talk to you later.